from the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas. I'm Christopher Calloway, your host for Creator Talks, the interview show for comic book aficionados. On this, my final interview for 2020, my guest is Tony Isabella. Tony began working for Marvel Comics on October 31st, 1972. He shares his thoughts about working at Marvel and about some of the people he worked alongside. What was it like working for editors Roy Thomas, Stan Lee, and Len Wein? Among the Marvel comics we discuss that Tony wrote are Ghost Rider, The Champions, Luke Cage, Power Man, and Black Goliath. Tony also wrote Daredevil, and back when the book was called Daredevil and the Black Widow, he explains why he had to take Black Widow out of the book as one of the main characters. Learn why one of his characters in Ghost Rider was changed at the end of the story. Tony shares his thoughts about working for DC over the years. He talks about when he pitched Black Lightning to DC, why he left the series in 1978, and his ultimate plans for the series' villain during its revival in 1995. Tony lays out why he has a problem with the way Black Lightning has been portrayed in other DC magazines, and why his 2018 six-part story, Cold Dead Hands, is true to the character's core values. We discuss the future of single-issue comics, superhero movies, Tony's blog, and a series of books he plans to write about cheesy monster movies. We cover all this and more in this jam-packed year-end interview, along with my kicking back with the creator questions, which include what he likes to do for recreation, his beverage of choice, his favorite birthday, and his guilty pleasure. Please join me in welcoming my guest, writer, editor, and blogger, Tony Isabella. Here now on Creator Talks. Tony, welcome to Creator Talks. Thanks for having me. I'm glad you're here, and I hope you're doing well because we're all corona coping. This pandemic continues on and on, creates a lot of stress, anxiety. I get it. I have two young boys at home, so it is tough keeping them happy. And they have some anxiety, too, although they don't express it outwardly, but they are. How have you found to be the best way to manage your own anxiety and stress during the pandemic? I've been dealing with anxiety and stress for years. And one of the ways I cope with this, and I put this on my online venues, is every day I post a thing that makes me happy. It could be a person. It could be a TV show. It could be a movie or a comic book. It could be just doing five errands in under an hour. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I try to find something that brings me joy every single day. It can be difficult, you know, especially with the pandemic, or with the racist president, uh, with so many other things. But I always manage to come up with at least one thing a day that makes me happy. Oh, that's really good. Yeah, I find it for myself at the end of the day, when we're all tucked in, everyone's ready to go to bed, and everyone's home safe, that's a good day. That's a good moment yeah. to kind of take in and say, Whew, thank God, we're all okay today. We just passed a holiday, Halloween, which was also your anniversary date, starting Marvel on October 31st, 1972. My Marvel-versary. That's what we call it, my Marvel-versary. Marvel-versary. <laughs> I've been reading a lot of comics from that period because I had a taste of it when I was little. They were bought for me. And then a year or two later, I started buying a lot of Marvel comics just because I liked them and it became the habit, the obsession, the hobby. And I'd like to know a little more about that era when you began. And it was Roy Thomas who discovered you from your fandom work and hired you as an assistant editor. And I know you worked on fancies and so did Roy. So I'm sure that probably caught his eye. How did that first meeting go when you started at Marvel low back those years ago? The way this worked is Roy and I had known each other from my fanzine writing. We had met at some conventions. We were, you know, kind of long distance friends. And Stan Lee needed somebody to help him with various projects. And Roy knew, knowing that I wanted to get into comics, thought of me because I'd been working for a newspaper. You know, he had read my fanzine stuff. He had read a couple of trial scripts I had sent to Marvel, and he figured I could do this. And as it turned out, when I got to New York, you know, they desperately needed somebody to basically act as the editor and packager of their British weeklies, starting with Mighty World of Marvel, and then Spider-Man Comics Weekly, and Avengers Comics Weekly. And basically what we would do, we would reprint old Marvel stories, broken up into chapters to more closely mimic 
the traditional British weeklies. We'd put them together in New York and then send the boards to Great Britain to have them printed and, of course, distributed in newsstands. And it was weird dealing with Great Britain because they kept switching printers. Every time they went to a new printer, our deadlines got moved up. You know, especially when we had three different weekly titles, there were weeks when I had to put together six to nine issues of the various weeklies to meet the new deadline. So it was a, a work intensive thing. I got the reputation of a workhorse. And so other things kept uh, going at me. Uh, my first meeting with Stan was just great. I mean, you know, Stan uh, did not stand on ceremony. I was a Marvel guy now. And, you know, as long as you did the work you were expected to do, you were okay with Stan and Roy. Neither one of them was very middle management type. They didn't overmanage you. Once they knew you could do the job, they pretty much left you alone. And so I had an opportunity to try things that didn't always work, but I also always had Dan Lee and Roy Thomas and Saab Brosky, who was my immediate superior, to learn from. So I had some of the best teachers, you know, a new comics guy could have. Who were you closest to at Marvel when you worked there? Who was your closest confidant and friend? That's hard to say. Um, you know, there always had to be some distance between Dan and me and, and Roy and me. You know, it's because they were the bosses. Don McGregor and I were pretty close. We sometimes butt his head, but we were pretty close. Uh, Rich Buckler, Pablo Marcus, we generally worked in the office. Mike Esposito and Frank Giacoyer were like Italian uncles to me. They very much reminded me of my own Italian uncles, so I spent a lot of time with them. George Russo was just a fun guy. He worked in the same large office as Saab Rotsky and Pablo Marcus and myself. But George would always arrange like file cabinets, so he almost had like his own little private closet-like room. <laughs> and so I'd be working at my desk, and when George needed to go over something or just wanted to impart knowledge to me, you'd hear George's voice from behind these file cabinets going, Tony, Tony. And through George, I became close with Larry Lieber, and Larry and I, you know, I just called Larry a few days ago on his birthday, so Larry and I are pretty close. And Don McGregor and I have become closer, you know, as the years goes on. We generally see each other at several conventions. You would have an idea. And the Marvel and DC editors, in some cases, require changes that were very different from what you had in mind. For example, there was the ghostwriter Johnny Blaze, where you had a character who was like a Jesus-type companion, that they changed this, that he turned out to be a demon in the end. That storyline... And the ending I intended was approved by Roy Thomas, mm -hmm. Len Wein, and Marv Wolfman. It was an assistant editor, Jim Shooter, who took it upon himself because he was offended by it. And he denies this to this day, but he's lying. He pulled it back from production. The book was ready to go. He pulled it back from production and rewrote two or three pages and had some redrawing done to come up with Jesus was always a demon in disguise, which makes absolutely no sense to anyone who'd been reading the book for this two-year storyline. And that's one of the things I dislike most about comics, the arrogance of people coming along and changing stuff that was created by, you know, more individual writers who were, quite frankly, their betters. And that always has bothered me. It bothered me when other, you know, people have done it. When I've taken over a strip, such as Ghost Rider from Gary Friedrich, I tried very hard to keep as much as I could of Gary's work because Gary could do things I couldn't do. Gary had experiences that I didn't have. My Ghost Rider was more superhero because just that's more what I was comfortable with. But I know from my friendship with Gary Friedrich, again, in later years, Gary really liked what I did with the character. So as a practice, do you like to honor what went before in terms of the previous creator? Because I know some will just retcon things and change everything and say, okay, now it's my start. Yeah, I try to be respectful. Uh, when I wrote Hawkman for DC, I pretty much kept everything intact except for a run of issues that had been edited by George Cashton that had Carter Hall's identity revealed, that had treated Hawkgirl like a sidekick, doing things like, no, you can't come on this mission, Hawk Girl, because it's too dangerous for a girl. Those were terrible stories. It was like a five or six issue run. Didn't last because the sales just tanked. But yeah, I threw out those issues, but everything else I kept, 
And if there were elements that didn't quite make sense to me, I found a way to make them work within the continuity. One of the stories that really just surprised me was The Champions, which I read when I was a kid. And I liked your idea of it being a buddy book with Angel and Iceman, but changes were required with specific types of members that had to be in the team changed completely from what you had in mind. Well, I wanted to do Route 66 with young heroes traveling the country, meeting hot young women and fighting villains. That was my model for the book. Uh, it would have been Marvel's first buddy book in a lot of ways. you got to understand, I love Len Wein. Len Wein w- was a brother to me. But Len was what I called an editor savant in that Len would get these notions that he was convinced were absolutely right. He didn't believe Luke Cage had super strength, for example. He busted through a stone wall. He said, well, that's just because he's invulnerable and he could keep punching the wall until it broke. And I'm saying, yes, he did it for 500 years. (laughs) Uh, He was very upset that the gentleman ghost in my Hawkman stories was an actual ghost because he always liked that there'd be mystery about it. Was he a ghost? Was he just a clever villain? And my response to that was, well, the guy who created the gentleman ghost, Bob Canninger, made him an actual ghost, and the creator of the ghost outranks you, Len. But in the case of the champions, I couldn't really ignore Len because he was my boss, and Len had all these notions that every superhero team had to have five members, one and only one of them had to be super strong, one of them had to be a woman, And the one that really threw me was one of them had to have their own book. When he told me every superhero group has five members, I go, you mean like the Fantastic Four? And he goes, exactly. (laughs) So, you know, I mean, I was allowed to pick the characters. I had written Black Widow and Daredevil because I just thought their pairing hurt both characters. But I loved the Black Widow, so she was easy for the woman. Nobody was using Hercules, who I always thought was a fun character. And I added Ghost Rider simply because I was the regular Ghost Rider writer, and I figure I could quietly write him out of adventures when he had big stuff going on in his own book. And so having this team of heroes, you know, I needed to find a purpose for them, which I don't think I ever really achieved, which is to make them the superheroes of the common man, the people who had like basically created an agency to help people in trouble. Because too many superhero books, and this is especially true today, don't have superheroes helping people. The superheroes are strictly concerned with their old enemies, their own lives. They're not out there helping people. I was very pleased when Mark Wade brought back the champions concept and actually managed to achieve what I had wanted to achieve, which is a superhero group that was there for the people. So yeah, I never thought I really got the hang of that concept. For a long time, I was kind of embarrassed by my champions work, but over the years, So many people have told me how much they've loved it that my opinion of it has gone up a bit. You know, you've sat on both sides of the table, editing, writing, and you've already talked about some of the editors that you really like that just kind of let you go. What do you think is a good working relationship between the editor and the writer? My most recent experience at a major company was writing Black Lightning Cold Dead Hands, which was a reboot of Black Lightning. But I figure if anybody has an excuse to reboot the character, it's his creator. Uh, I was working with Jim Chadwick and Harvey Richards. These two guys were two of the best editors I've ever worked with. They never tried to get me to write their stories. Everything they did was to help me make my stories better. They didn't hand down edicts. They'd say, this is something we might have a problem with, or this is something we want to discuss. And it was always my option to take their advice or not. And, you know, we always work stuff out. They elevated my work in that six-issue series, which, of course, after that series was done, DC decided, hey, why don't we make Black Lightning Batman support me grow instead and reduce Black Lightning to basically a sidekick for Batman. He abandons his family. He abandons his school. He abandons his community so that he could do Batman's legwork. Uh, Batman puts him in an apartment, you know, a penthouse apartment in Gotham City, where I assume every time he visits, he leaves the money on the table afterwards. And it was just to be so totally insulting to take DC's most iconic black hero and reduce him to that. It's just been painful watching how little DC respects or understands 
a guy who's a very easy to understand character. Jefferson Pierce cares about three things. And this is, I'm a core values guy. I figure that things change over time, but you have to adhere to the core values of the characters. And in the case of Jefferson Pierce, he cares about his family. He cares about his students and he cares about his community. And he abandons all that to become Batman's sidekick in Batman and the Outsiders. And that's just not the guy I created or the guy I was writing. And he's not the guy you see on the TV series, which is brilliant. The TV series adheres to those core values and improves upon them. It's both delightful and unnerving to see the TV show do certain characters better than I ever did. Tobias Whale in the TV show is better than any Tobias Whale I ever wrote. So it is possible to expand upon a character, but only if you adhere to the character's core values. I think a lot of the writers these days don't understand the core values or just simply don't care about them. They just want to do their own thing. And I think that's a little bit arrogant when you're dealing with characters who've been part of the popular culture for decades. Well, that's really important to me because I'm a long-time reader since, well, like I said, back in the 70s. And I've gone back and read books from the 60s and further back. And when I see something that is so different from the character that I remember, not that I'm not opposed to change or that shakes things up a little bit, but when it's so different, I don't recognize the character, I lose interest and I drop off until someone gets a hold of the character and brings them back to their core values, him or her. And, and then I recognize that character again. Even if they take them in different places, they still have to be true to themselves and the way you describe the Batman and the Outsiders just like makes no sense at all, especially after I, I read your story. I see exactly what you mean. And when I read the story about how Black Lightning came about, my jaw hit the floor <laughs> when I read that DC had wanted you to rework a script about uh, another character, the Black Bomber, and what they intended to do with it. I was just floored when I read that. I couldn't believe it. And I always like to point out that they had two scripts written by Bob Kaniger and edited by Jerry Conway. And even those are probably two of the most offensive comic scripts I've ever read in my life. I always like to stress that Jerry and Bob were good guys. They were progressive guys. They were basically doing a superhero take on the Watermelon Man movie that Godfrey Cambridge starred in around that time. And I think they were just too close to their creation to realize how offensive it was. And it wasn't until I was able to boil down my argument to do you really want DC's first headline black hero to be a white racist that DC finally realized that, yeah, this wasn't going to work. And then I was given like two or three weeks to come up with my own character. And as I also like to stress everything important about black lightning and Jefferson Pierce in their world was created by me before I even pitched it to DC. Yes, it was work for hire. It wasn't supposed to be work for hire. It was supposed to be a partnership agreement, but that's a whole other story. But the thing is, is, you know, everything important about Jefferson Pierce was in place the day I pitched the character to DC Comics. Something that drives me crazy, when that character was used on Super Friends, they had to change it to Black Vulcan. And I'm like, why do they do that? Like, why do they change up what has already been established? Well, because Hanna Rivera originally wanted to use Black Lightning. Now, my deal with DC, which again, they didn't honor, let's just say DC got $100 per episode of Super Friends for 10 DC characters, and Black Lightning was one of them. I would get 10% of the $10 they got for Black Lightning. So I'd get a dollar for every episode. DC didn't want to pay me out of their take, which is what they should have done, which was what they had agreed to do. So they told Hanna-Barbera that Hanna-Barbera would have to pay extra to use Black Lightning, and Hanna-Barbera's response was basically, well, we're just going to steal the character. And they did. And DC was perfectly fine about that because it didn't cost them any money. That was why I, I broke off working for DC the first time around. They had violated so many of their agreements with me by that time. My last issue of the original Black Lightning series was called The Other Black Lightning. And it involved a con woman named Barbara Hanna, who had gotten some dumb guy to be a black lightning figure and kind of taking them on the road to make money off them. And somehow, and I probably credit Joe Orlando and Jack Harris, who was my editor on the book for letting me get away with this. <laughs> Both of those guys do exactly what I was doing. 
I know Joe was hoping I'd stay around D.C. Joe and I always got along well. I always got along with Jack Harris, who I think is a terrific writer and editor. But, you know, they just had screwed me over so many times by that point. And honest to God, my relationship with D.C., I feel like a battered wife. I don't mean to minimize the trauma that women go through, but it feels like I keep coming back hoping this time it's going to be different. And in some ways it is. They're pretty much living up to their financial agreements with me. And of course, the TV show treats me so well. It has nothing to do with DC Comics. It has to do with how great the people who put together the TV show and perform in it and work behind the scenes are. They respect me, they love me, and I love them right and respect them right back. So things get a little better, but generally speaking, I mean, the way my relationship with DC always go, always seems to go. You're optimistic. Yeah. I mean, you know, I'm not really writing for Marvel except for the occasional introduction. I never have to chase Marvel for money. I'm always treated with respect by Marvel personnel. They invite me to things, you know, I was invited to the premiere of Luke Cage. I was invited to Ant-Man and the Wasp because they credited my work on Bill Foster as being important to that movie, which is great. I got to take my wife to that premiere. She got to meet her girlhood crush, uh, Michael Douglas. I got to introduce her to Michael Douglas and told him, this is my wife. She'd had a crush on you since Streets of San Francisco. <laughs> Michael, flick devil that he is, and he takes her by the hands, looks deep into her eyes and said, oh, you're much too young to have seen me in that. Oh, what a charmer. <laughs> two thoughts went through my mind. This is how he got Catherine Zeta-Jones. And two, is Barb coming back to Cleveland with me? Uh, <laughs> fortunately, she did. But, you know, I have met a lot of the stars, you know, of the superhero movies and everything. But everybody I've met, Mike Coulter from Luke Cage and Lawrence Fishburne, who was in Ant-Man and the Wasp. And every performer I've met who's been on these shows has been delightful. They love being part of these bigger universe. They love having this new fan base. And I suspect it's not lost on them that should things slow up, and there are conventions again. Then they can always go to a convention and make several thousand dollars selling autographed photos. Being part of these universes is a big deal for these actors. And I've yet to run into anybody who doesn't appreciate it. I mean, I'm sure there's people out there who don't. But the ones I've met really appreciate it. That's great to hear. And you have done so much, made so many contributions writing stories about black superheroes. Like you mentioned, Luke Cage, Power Man, Black Lightning, and also co-creating Misty Knight. You've done so much. Young black readers back then did not have many superhero role models. They didn't have anyone, especially at DC. And they were always relegated to the background, but you brought them out to the forefront. Which of those is your proudest accomplishment? Definitely Black Lightning. I mean... There are things I wanted to do with the black characters I wrote at Marvel that I never really got around to. I had intended to clear Luke Cage of the crimes he was falsely accused of and actually send him back to school because I thought that was something important to show the young readers. And also it wasn't lost on me that I can send him to the same school that Peter Parker goes to. That was important to me with Black Elias, who had wanted to call Giant Man, but apparently Giant Man so really bad, so they didn't want me to use the name. <laughs> Black Elias is a stupid name, I, but there it was. You know, it's like it was all I had at the time. Mm -hmm. But you know, I wanted to show here's a successful scientist and everything. But with Black Lightning, I got to design a character from the ground up, and so I made him a teacher because every kid knows what a teacher is. I set him in an urban setting because that's closer to my experience. Not that I have the black experience, I don't. I've studied it. I am respectful of it but I don't have that experience. But that sort of street level story is closer to where I came from and where my head is. Just things like that. I mean, uh, I vowed to work on characters of color as much as possible because my first black friends were comic book fans in Cleveland, Ohio, Leroy, Bruce, and Dennis. Cleveland was very segregated when I was a teenager. I had started a comic book club at Cadell Recreation Center, where decades later, Tamir Rice would be murdered by uh, an unfit police officer. Those guys came from the east side of Cleveland to the west side of Cleveland to attend my meetings. And I always felt, I never expressed it to them. In fact, they were very surprised 
to learn the role they played in my working on these characters in recent years. But I just thought it's not fair that my friends don't have more characters like them. So I always told myself if I was lucky enough to get into comics, I would try to work on and create characters of color. Diversity wasn't really part of my language. I was a teenager, Mm -hmm. but fairness was. And it just didn't strike me as fair that my friends didn't have more heroes like them in the comic books. You know, they've made their way to movies now, like you mentioned, and television, Black Lightning. Do you think that people will get burnout from all the superhero movies and TV shows? Because there's a lot of competition for our attention and entertainment in any form. How can we overcome being overexposed to it? Well, you got to pick and choose. You know, for a while there, I was trying to watch every superhero-based show. Mm -hmm. And right now, as far as the CW goes, you know, the shows I've been watching have been uh, Black Lightning and Stargirl. Part of my reason for that is that I just got tired of smart characters making bad decisions. Not that Black Lightning and Stargirl don't make, and characters in those movies don't make bad decisions, but it seems to me that this whole idea that bad decisions make good stories, well, that's true, but it's not the only way to make good stories. So I know when I wrote Black Lightning Cold Dead Hands, I set out to not have a younger Jefferson Pierce in that series make bad decisions. Even when it looks like he's made a bad decision, no, it's part of a plan. I like smart heroes. I like heroes who don't make these bad decisions that put them in peril just for the sake of putting them in peril. So that was part of it. But there's a lot of them, and you pick and choose. I've been enjoying The Boys and Harley Quinn. Now, The Boys and Harley Quinn are not something people would think Tony Isabella would get into (laughs) because they're really violent, Mm -hmm. especially Harley Quinn, where innocent people die. You know, and that's not normally where my head is, but Harley Quinn is just so much fun. You know, I'm really into that. I like the boys a lot. I like the boys TV show better than I like the comic book. I pick and choose. I don't try to watch all of them. I'll see a superhero movie from another country on Netflix or Amazon Prime, and I'll watch them. I recently watched something called Freaks, You're One of Us, uh, which was a German movie or a French movie. I don't remember, but I like that a lot. And then I watched something called Unknown Origins, which was a Spanish movie that I really liked up to the last like 20 minutes when it made me so angry that I need to write a blog about it. (laughs) One of the things that bothers me a lot is villains who get away with the most heinous crimes ever. Villains who succeed where the heroes fail. Chester Gould had the right idea in Dick Tracy. You create a great villain, but you don't have to keep him around beyond that great story. You know, one of the last things I pitched to DC was a alternate universe graphic novel called The Man Who Killed the Joker. Because why is the Joker still alive? You can't keep him in Arkham or prison. He's going to get out. He's going to kill hundreds of people. If I were Batman, my moral choice would be to empty a revolver into the Joker's head, fire it again until there was nothing left but a bloody stump, and then ask Superman to throw it into the sun. You know, it's probably not what people think Batman should do, even though Mm -hmm. he's pretty toxic, even without that. But you can't keep letting the Joker do this. The Joker's had its day. Create somebody new. Create the next great Batman adversary. Don't go back to the well over and over again. Just by luck of the draw, I I read two recent issues of Amazing Spider-Man, which Peter Parker wasn't in them. It was just Spider-Man. I'm going, well, this doesn't seem like a core value Spider-Man if it's just the guy in the costume. And the Green Goblin's back. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, he's still around? (laughs) He's back. (laughs) I had plans to kill Tobias Whale in my second Black Lightning series in the 90s. And had I been allowed to continue my reboot of Black Lightning, eventually Tobias Whale would have been out of the picture because, again, the Chester Gould method, come up with a great villain, tell a great story or two with him, and then move on to the next great villain. Otherwise, you get caught in a cycle and people get bored. They're like, same old, same old. They want that comfort food in a way, but at the same time, they want something different. Tony, you've witnessed a lot of change over the years writing, and I like your thoughts on the comic business. Are we witnessing the final days of the three ninety nine dollars or higher single-issue comic? You know, it seems to me like we could, because certainly I don't think DC Comics is as interested in publishing ongoing titles as they once were. Marvel still is profitable doing that. 
I'm not sure DC is. The trade paperback, you know, the collective editions, those are a pretty good business model. Those are doing well. You get library sales on those. Because of the modern era, you can sell, you know, electronic versions of these comics and everything. I would miss the ongoing monthly. Yeah, that was the industry I wanted to get into, but that industry is changing and might not be around anymore. Mm-hmm. I know I was crushed last year because Marvel Comics was where I wanted to be when I was a kid. And then last year, my Marvel royalty checks, which used to have Spider-Man on them, became Disney checks with Mickey Mouse on them. Mickey Mouse is a great character, but I don't have the same relationship with Mickey Mouse that I do with Spider-Man. So it kind of bothers me that I no longer get Marvel checks, I get Disney checks. What do you think the future is of superhero comics? I think there's always going to be room for them because, you know, the movies, when they're done well, are fun and profitable. There's a lot of different ways you can take the superhero. It's not just a kid's genre. I mean, I think that the classic superheroes should be accessible to kids. But there's lots of different ways to go. I mean, The Boys is obviously very different from Captain America's movies. You know, I think as long as you try to do different things, as long as you get good writing and good acting, I think the superhero genre will survive in the movies, in TV. I think you'll still see superhero comic books because at its worst, the comics industry is research and development for the motion picture industry, TV industry which is not the best place for comic books to be, but it's not an awful place for them to be because there's so much need for ideas in Hollywood, which you know is bereaved of ideas on its own. Having the comics industry there for them to come to. I mean, you look at all the indie comics that are moving on to movies or TV. You look at the variety in these comics. I think that's a good thing. And there's variety even within the superhero genre. So yeah, I mean, I, I don't think the superhero genre is going to pass. I really hope that we still have the equivalent of newsstand comic books. I'm less sure about that. I would hate to see that happen because I think that would hurt a lot of the comic shops. And the comic shops have been the backbone of this industry for decades and decades. And I don't want to see the industry abandon them. Here, here. I agree. For DC Comics to shake up distribution in the middle of a pandemic, no matter how successful that may ultimately prove to be, it was just wrong. It put unbearable pressure on shops that were already facing unbearable pressure. Really bad timing, bad move. As we get into your other work that you're doing, I want to let people know about your blog site, TonyIsabellaBlogspot.com, and tell people about some of the things they can find on there. You had mentioned writing blogs about movies and TV shows. I write blogs about movies and TV shows, about politics, about old comics, about things going on in my life. Because, you know, it has no sponsor, and therefore it makes me no money, I can write about pretty much anything I want to do. Uh, Every now and then I discover some old thing, a plot that was never used or something like that. I'll put that in the blog. And right now, uh, the major things I'm doing right now, I mean, I have a bucket list of 300 different things I want to write before I kick the bucket. And this includes new comic book universes, novels, plays, and such. But the projects on my desk right now, I write gags for John Lustig's Last Kiss feature. It's on Go Comics three times a week. And I usually write at least one gag a week for John. And that's been great fun. We take old panels from romance comics out of context and we write new gags for them. And John's been a great boss on that. And I get a kick out of doing that because it really exercises some muscles. I ghosted syndicated newspaper strips. But this is the first time that my name's on my work. You know, I have an editor just really, we push each other. I mean, I do something and John gets an idea from it. John does something and gives me an idea. I work on John's Last Kiss, and he and I are starting to develop a second feature of that nature. I'm going to be doing a series of books on my second love after comics, which is cheesy monster and horror movies. Oh, great. And the first of these books is going to be on shark movies. And as I put together the list of the movies I'm writing about, I realized that I could do four books on shark movies if I wanted to. (laughs) The Sharknado people, the Asylum, they alone have done 19 shark movies wow. in the past 10 years. Jeez. Yes, I had to add them up. You know, <laughs> wow, there's a lot of them. 
But this book, I'm covering all the Jaws movies in the first book. I'm covering a non-shark movie, Grizzly, because it was one of the first movies to try to duplicate the Jaws formula. And while I can't cover every Sharknado movie or every multi-headed shark attack movie, there will be a great deal of variety of shark movies covered in this book, including one that doesn't exist. These books will have a common theme. I don't want to give away the title yet, but I have a common title. But every book will be something different, whether it's shark movies in this first one, summer camp movies, Christmas horror movies. And every one of these books will have one movie that I've completely made up. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Just because I can. <laughs> well, what you didn't make up and I read about on your blog, and I hope these get into the books, is Moose the Movie and one title I can't forget, Lamageddon. Lamageddon, yes. <laughs> there will be eventually a book. I mean, I know some of the themes, like spiders and snakes will be a theme. Mm-hmm. Christmas movies, holiday horror movies. There will come a time when I do a book of shaggy monsters, you know, like Lamageddon, like Moose the movie. Maybe I'll throw a few yetis in there. There'll be one book called Lions and Tigers and Bears that will have horror movies involving lions and tigers and bears. My hope is to write at least two of these a year. If I get the momentum going, I might try to do four of these a year. Oh, okay. It'll kind of introduce my sense of humor to an audience beyond the comics audience. At this point, without a lot of comics work coming in, I'll probably be doing more books of these nature on comics, on old comic books, on my life. People have been asking me for an autobiography, and I am slowly working on that. There will be a book called Black Lightning and My Road to Diversity, which will cover you know my work with Black Lightning and other characters of color. If I can't write comic books, which is really my first love, I can write books about comics and other things I love. Excellent. Well, as these come out, I'll be watching for these. I'll be checking out your blog, reading that and looking for these. And as they come out, I'll read the book and then I'll have you on rather than ahead of time, if that's okay. Oh, that breaks the bottle of talk show hosts. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I can do both, but it'd be fun to read it first. (laughs) Well, before we close out, I'd like to ask you the fun questions I ask all my guests. I call it kicking back with the creator. And they're just to learn more about you as a person. Nothing difficult. For example, first question, what do you like to do for recreation? Actually, my recreation is generally, my wife and I watch Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy every night. (laughs) We're really good at it. Much better than we'd be if we were actually on those programs where our answers actually could mean something. (laughs) especially now with the pandemic and everything and trying to avoid a lot of the political shows going on. I've just gotten in the habit of surfing Amazon Prime and Netflix and HBO Max and just finding strange movies, movies I'd never heard of. We watched UB Halloween with Adam Sandler, mostly because it had China McClain from the Black Lightning show in it, but it was a fun movie. And I learned because of this movie that there is a Sandler verse. Apparently several Adam Sandler movies are all connected. Oh, <laughs> no idea. <laughs> I had it because I hadn't, hadn't watched, but you know, movies like a movie called, but I'm a cheerleader about a, a young cheerleader sent to a conversion camp because she doesn't think she's gay. You know, she doesn't do anything that she's gay. Although during the course of the movie, she realized, yes, that's who I am. But, you know, it it has a few uncomfortable stereotypes because of when it was made. Mm -hmm. But it's a really solid, warm-hearted movie about uh, a young woman discovering who she is and living her truth. So, yeah, I find these fascinating things. I'll take a chance. You know, it's not like we can go out to parties or ball games or even the movie theaters these days. I have what I call my pandemic home theater. Tony, what was your favorite birthday? Boy, it's hard to say because I'm so old. <laughs> I'm 69 in December. That's a heck of a lot of birthdays. You know, it might have been the first birthday after I started work at Marvel because my birthday is December 22nd, very close to Christmas, so I got cheated every year. But my youngest sister was devastated at the thought that I might not be home for Christmas because at that point, I wasn't going to be home for Christmas. And she said she didn't want to have Christmas if I wasn't there. I think she would have been about seven at that point. And so I arranged to get my birthday off so that I could travel to Ohio. Uh, In those days, you know, you could get a a $50 airfare to Ohio. 
Well, because of weather and scheduling and everything else, it took me 20 hours from New York to Cleveland. And I managed to get to my parents' house with like one hour of my birthday left. And of course, my sister was asleep by that time. But when she woke up in the morning and there I was sleeping on the couch, she just lit up. If they had wrapped me up, it would have been her best Christmas present of that year. Because it was so hard for me to get home for Christmas, I think that might be my favorite birthday. Now, thinking back to when you were a teenager, what posters and or pictures did you have on your bedroom wall? I shared a bedroom with my two brothers, and I don't recall that we ever really had. You know, I'm trying to think the first time I put a poster on a wall was probably when I had my first apartment in Cleveland before I'd gone to work for Marvel, and I bought one of those six feet tall Vampirella posters. I forget who drew it, but yeah, I had that on my door at my first apartment inside. Because if I put it on outside, the creep across the way would have stolen it. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, that was probably the first thing I ever hung up on a wall was probably that Vampirella poster. You know, when I lived at home, my father had built an office for me in the basement so that I could, you know, write there. And I I might have had a Raquel Welch poster up at that time, but the first one I really know for sure was that Vampirella poster. Hypothetical situation. You're stuck on a deserted island. You'll get off eventually, so you're not worried about survival. But if you had one book to read, or related books, for pleasure, what would that book be? The book that sustained me, you know, when I first moved to New York, And I was living in a basement apartment in Brooklyn and things, you know, it was very scary. And I wasn't sure that that was where I was supposed to be. And I had with me Dangerous Visions and again, Dangerous Visions, edited by Harlan Ellison, who became a close friend of mine a few years later. And those books, especially Harlan's introductions, which talk about the importance of what writers did. And those books sustained me during some really rough times when I first moved to New York. So I think if I were on a desert island, those are the books I would want. Now, when you're relaxing, what is your beverage of choice? Wild Cherry Pepsi, which is not something a guy with type 2 diabetes should (laughs) be drinking. But my deal with myself is that if I can keep my blood sugar levels down to 110 or less, then I can have a Pepsi. Mm Moderation is the key. So I work very hard to keep my blood sugar down to that level so I can keep enjoying Pepsi. Very good. So my next question, my final question, and this might be the answer which you just gave me, what is your guilty pleasure? Ice cream. I've been buying these M&M vanilla sandwiches. It's like this M&M cookie uh, with ice cream in between, and they're not really good for me, but I buy a box of six and I try to spread it out over two weeks, and sometimes I actually do that. (laughs) Other times, it's like, well, my blood sugar's down. I could have an ice cream today. Sure, I had one yesterday, and I'll probably have one tomorrow, but I can have one today. (laughs) I'm lucky. My blood pressure is really good for a man of my advanced years. Blood sugar has been good. And, you know, you get all these health things from the doctors. I believe in science. I believe in listening to experts. But I also know myself, if I don't have my Pepsi every now and then, I'm going to be cranky and I'm not going to be able to focus on my work. So I believe in moderation. You're not maybe not supposed to have pizza, but you could have a slice of pizza every now and then. Uh, And that's what I do. It's all moderation. You know, I've never smoked, never drank alcohol to any extent. So, yeah, it's moderation. I don't deny myself the stuff I really like because I know that denying myself that stuff will have a mental effect on me that's not conducive to my work or having other people around me. I mean, I'm already a pretty grumpy old man. <laughs> I, didn't think that I, mean, I tell people that when I die, I want to come back as a vengeful spirit of justice that will make the specter look like Casper the Friendly Ghost. <laughs> so. Tony, this has been delightful and refreshing. I really appreciate you spending the time with me, and uh, thanks so much for being on Creative Talks. Thanks for having me. You have a great night. All right, folks, and thus concludes our interviews for 2020. 
thank you, one and all who listen this year. I'll be taking off a couple of weeks from the show for the holidays. And speaking of the holidays, if you have a chance, please leave me the gift of a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It goes a long way to helping the show reach new listeners. And if you've already left a review, thank you so much for taking the time. For the new year, I already have three interviews recorded that I'll be working on to get prepared for January. One is with a returning guest I have not had on the show since its very early days. The other two are history-based graphic novels, and one is about a great composer, and the other is about a great American historical figure. So you can look for me announcing those interviews on social media, at Creator Talks Pod on Facebook, Twitter, and on Instagram. That's Creator Talks Pod. If you would like to contact me directly, my email address is creatortalks at gmail.com. That's creatortalks at gmail.com. The one I mentioned on my earlier shows no longer exists. I canceled that account because I own this one. And guess what? All of my podcasts on YouTube also disappeared because I no longer have that account. I will be returning these shows to YouTube on a new channel that is mine. I don't think I'll be going back and posting all the ones I've already posted. That's a lot of work. But future shows will be posted on YouTube as well under that new channel. I'd like to wish each of you a very happy holiday, whether you're celebrating Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, or you're just enjoying the winter holidays. You deserve a break. It's been a very difficult year. I hope you do find some pleasure and respite in the holidays. And let's all wish for a very happy new year. And until my next interviews in the new year, follow me at Creator Talks Pod for a few surprises at the very end of 2020. That's all for now. For Creator Talks, this has been your host, Christopher Calloway. Until next time.